Good evening, folks. This is Pastor Steve from Chowchilla First Assembly of God with tonight's Bible study. Uh, before we go any further, let's open up with a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless this evening. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and for your grace and for your mercy. I thank you for those who are joining us this evening, that your Holy Spirit will be with them and bless them, and for whoever watches this in the hours or days ahead. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide and direct everything that is spoken here this evening in our, our prayer for specific needs, as well as, Father God, our, uh, our uh, uh, looking at your word and, and diving into your word and growing to understand more about what your word is wanting to speak to our hearts tonight. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, uh, we are here tonight to pray. To start off with, just give me a second here. I'm trying to find Facebook here. There we go. I had my microphone on. Oh, there we go. I have to turn it myself down. All right. Uh, this helps me to know who's following, and it's good to have you with us, uh, all of you who have joined us uh, this evening. And listen, I just I, I have some sad news to share with you uh, to start off this evening. Uh, we received word on Monday or Tuesday that Pastor Crabtree, Charles Crabtree, passed away Sunday. Uh, I know that he has been a part of this church, coming here once a year for some time now. And uh, there were no details about how he passed away. They just mentioned that he, he passed away uh, Sunday. I don't know if it was just after midnight on Sunday or just before or sometime. Um, and... We need to pray for his family, that God would be with him, Sister Crabtree, that God would strengthen her during this time. Definitely a man who has made a great mark in the lives of many people, uh, even myself in the past, and uh, the ministry that God has given him. And uh, we are, we, we are, we're going to miss him. We're going to miss having him here in Chowchilla, blessing us. Uh, and we'll just continue to pray for the family that God will strengthen them, and Sister Crabtree particularly. I'd like us to also pray for uh, Brother Kenny Marsh. Uh, after his procedure that he had last week, chemotherapy treatment, uh, it has not been uh, an easy go for him. He's finding himself weak, and we need to pray for him, that God will strengthen him and build him up as he continues to believe God to bring complete and total healing, that this tumor that he has been battling with will go away. Well, let's just say disappear in Jesus' name. And then let's continue praying for Barbara, the cousin of Juanita, that the Lord will touch her and minister to her and also deliver her from the cancer that she's battling with. And let's pray for Sister Capehart. Uh, Sister Capehart is such a joy. Every time S Sister Cindy and I are around her, her smile her laughter is such a such a, a wonderful thing, and and uh, she's been uh, dealing with some lung issues again, and we just need to pray that God will strengthen her, that she will not have a relapse into some of the issues that she had before, and that that uh, she will recover uh, completely and totally. She did sit, share with us this afternoon that things are going better, as she has sought prayer rather than going to the hospital, and that. Uh, what she was experiencing earlier today had begun to diminish. And so we're continuing to pray for her in that way and pray with us for her. There are a couple of people that are dealing with asthma as a result of what we're experiencing here <coughs> in uh, the Central Valley of California with the fires to the, to the northwest and southwest of us. And the valley is getting, has been filled up with that smoke from those fires. And now today was a little bit better, and we're praying that by... Uh, this weekend, if there's no additional storms or things like that, that the smoke uh, will begin to dissipate and we'll get back to some normal uh, uh, quality of air rather than what we're facing right now. But those who are struggling with uh, asthma, Sister Gregory's son-in-law, uh, Dan, needs uh, to be touched by the Lord to help him. And also, uh, uh, I believe it's... Uh, sister, uh, sister Gail, Duncan's grandson Nathan, also struggling with asthma, and we need to pray that the Lord will do, uh, will help these individuals, Dan and Nathan, during this time. And I know that some of some of the rest of us, I, I, I normally I've never dealt with allergies before, 
but I have found myself the last couple of days having to blow my nose and sneeze a lot. So I don't know if it's in relationship to the, uh, to the, uh, to the smoke in the air or not, but I know that a lot of us, it's, it is irritating us. And so let's pray that this thing will pass with the smoke. We also need to pray for a gentleman by the name of James Carr. I don't know who he is, but I do know that he was taken to the hospital with a brain tumor. And we need to pray for him, that God will touch him. I haven't had any recent news about his situation, but we need to trust that God will touch him and minister to him. He was on our prayer chain, and so we're going to continue praying for him. And I just wanted to let you know, James Carr is his name. And then last, <clears throat> last of all, uh, most of us are aware of what's going on in the Gulf right now with Hurricane Laura blowing up towards Louisiana and Texas right now, really just splitting the state line uh, with the eye of this particular uh, hurricane. And uh, we need to pray for the people that live there. There's been quite a bit of information given that the, the ocean surge in some places could be between 15 and 20 feet high. Uh, it's a Category 4 right now, and it's pretty dangerous. Uh, Brother Jason was sharing with me that he has some friends that live in Galveston, Tom and Angela Mueller, and we need to, to pray for them. God would protect them, and uh, they did everything they could to protect their home and all that stuff. They're, they're, they're west of the eye, and so uh, hopefully that will, will uh, uh, be enough to protect their, their home and things of that nature. But you may know someone down there. I know that we've had a lot of friends move out of the valley here to Texas, and let's pray uh, that the Lord will work and move in those situations. So I'm going to take these needs to the Lord in prayer. Would you agree with me that God will answer them according to his plans and his purposes in each of these individuals' lives? Father God, I come to you this evening thanking you again that we can come in faith believing you to answer our prayers. Lord, there are certain needs that... Uh, are self-evident tonight as we have received the news of the passing of Pastor Charles Crabtree. Now, Pastor Charles Crabtree has a, a legacy here in Northern California, Nevada, that goes way back many, many years, Father God, as he was pastor at San Jose Bethel Church and then went to the national office and served there as, as, uh, as a secretary for, or assistant superintendent, rather, for many, many years. And then from there, went on to be the president of at that time, what was called Zion Bible College. And Father God, he has uh, spoken in our church on numerous occasions, and it's been a blessing to the people of this church. I am only, I'm sad that I was looking forward to, if we were able to, to have him back this October, and was not aware that he was ailing physically. And so Lord, he has gone into your presence, and we thank you for that assurance in our hearts. But I pray that you would be with the family, uh, his wife and his children, his in-laws, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work and move in their lives. And for everyone who has been influenced by him directly or indirectly, God, that are hearing about this maybe for the first time this evening. And I pray that you would be with those loved ones uh, that have been impacted by his life. And God, I know that you're able to do that. We know where he's at. We have that confidence and we have that comfort in our hearts. I just had to have another warrior uh, lay down his, his spiritual weapons, as it were, a weapon of prayer, and so on and so forth. And now he is ushered into the reward of a life well lived for you. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would likewise move in our brothers' and sisters' lives. Father, I think of, of Kenny, Brother Kenny, Lord, who has been battling uh, courageously this cancer, trusting you, believing in you, Lord God. And I just pray that you would continue to work and that this cancer would be completely and totally uh, eradicated from his body, Father God, and that this t tumor would disappear completely. I know that you're able to, and we by faith agree together that it will happen by the stripes that Jesus bore upon his back. May he be healed completely. And Father, we pray the same for Barbara, that you would continue your work in her life, God, and uh, that she would continue to have good reports of the cancer disappearing and going away. Lord, I thank you and I praise you that you're a God who's able to do that. Lord, I pray for Sister Capehart that you would strengthen her body, O oh God, that you would minister to her. And Lord, that you would strengthen her heart as well, Father, as she has uh, had issues in the, in, in the past and the more recent past. Father God, I just pray that, Lord, whatever her body is going through right now would completely, completely 
go away and that you would be restored, Father, in Jesus' name. Father God, I pray for those who are struggling with the poor air quality as a result of the smoke uh, from the fires that is inundating our valley here where we live. And God, I pray for Dan and I pray for Nathan that these two individuals that prayer has been specifically asked for who are dealing with asthma. God, that you would bring healing and restoration to them in Jesus' name. God, I know you're able to do it, and I pray for anyone who might be adversely affected as a result of the smoke, that you would help us, Father God, uh, that you would protect us, Lord, from any residual effects in Jesus' name. Father, a name I failed to mention during the time of our prayers was Tammy Baker, God. I, want, I, I would like you to minister to her this evening, Father God, as she's been dealing with an issue with her knee, and, and uh, God, I just pray that you would heal her, restore her, continue your work in her life. We thank you, Father, for what you've done and for what you're continuing to do in her, in Jesus' precious name. Father God, I pray for James Carr. I don't know who he is, but you do. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would work and move. And God, that where he is at at this moment in time, if it's in the hospital in, in the Bay Area, Father God, where uh, they are they are. They are looking into treatment and trying to figure out what they can do with this brain tumor that he has been diagnosed with. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and move in a very special and powerful way. And God, that you bring healing to him. Father, there are a lot of folks in the uh, crosshairs of this, uh, of this hurricane that is bearing down on the Gulf Coast. Father God, Texas and Louisiana. And Father God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, your Holy Spirit would work and move in a very powerful and very real way, God, and that your hand would protect people from losing their lives. I ask that, Father God, and I know that storms come and natural disasters come, and your word says that in the latter times, these things will be even more frequent than what we have been used to in the past, and Lord, I the thought of losing lives as a result of, of a storm is, is tragic in and of itself. And so I pray, pray your special hedge of protection about people's lives, Father God. I know that you're able to move supernaturally. I know that you're able to even stop the storm as Jesus, you did the storm on the Sea of Galilee. But Father God, I want to yield to your will. And I know this is not something that's easy to ask, and maybe I should have more faith to believe you. You're able to. You're able to render it ineffective. God, let your purposes and plans be done, but protect lives, Father. I pray in Jesus' name. And we pray specifically for Tom and Angela Mueller, who live in Galveston, Father God. I pray that you would protect them, keep them safe. God, that you would protect their home. Lord, may your Holy Spirit work in their lives and continue to work, Father. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be lifted up and exalted. And the last thing I want to just throw in here, Father God, is, Lord, our country is in great need of you. It seems like there's an element within our country, Father God, it's, well, it's causing a lot of problems. There are other things I could call it, but Father God, I'd rather not be incendiary as it were tonight. You know my heart. They're opposed to you. They're anti-Christ. And God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, your Holy Spirit would work and move. And God, that you'd open the eyes of the American people. And Lord, as we move forward, that peace would replace the, the violent protest. And God, that your Holy Spirit would work and move in the hearts and lives of men. And that you would bring our country to a place of spiritual awakening once again. And Lord, that there would be a great harvest of souls across this land from coast to coast, from north to south. God, I know you're able to do it. I pray, oh God, that you would work and move and help us to be instruments in your hands to bring about this peace in the lives of people, the most important people coming to know you as their Lord and Savior and embracing and accepting the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, into their lives. Thank you for who you are, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Amen and amen. Folks, we're going to dive right into the Word tonight. And we've been in chapter 9 of Romans. We've been talking about Paul's attitude towards his own people, the Israelites. And we have answered several questions this past week. We were looking at, at the last uh, 
the third question, is God unjust to choose or elect people such as Isaac, Jacob, and even Pharaoh for his purposes? And that was verses 14 through 21 is what we looked at last week. And we uh, looked at the idea of election to serve in public. We also looked at the idea of, of election uh, uh, to salvation and the difference between election to service and election to salvation. We talked about the word election in, in a previous lesson where the importance of <clears throat> the importance of understanding what this word actually means. Actually, it was last week that we talked about the idea of election because it's been a question that's been thrown out there by a lot of theologians, a lot of people. Okay. A lot of people that have been... Um, been dealing with these things and what's been going on uh, in uh, Calvinism, Arminianism, and different thoughts or strains of, of uh, different strains of uh, theology regarding the idea of election, where some some believe that God just arbitrarily chooses who's going to be saved and and the rest are going to hell. Uh, others who would say, well, you have a free choice to come to Christ, but once you come to Christ, you can't leave Him. And then you have those who are free will all the way through, that you, you have the free will to accept Christ, and you have the free will to reject Christ. And so you have several different viewpoints on this issue. And we talked about that last week in, in detail. If you want to follow that, you can go on our Facebook page, and you can go under videos, uh, and you can find last week's study if you haven't had a chance to hear it yet. I think it would be important. Today we're going to look at the question, why is God patient with those who rebel against him? Why is God patient with those who rebel against him? Now, we're looking at Romans uh, chapter 9, verse 22 through 29. And let's look at that, 22 through 29. And this is what we read. And that he might make known, excuse me, verse 22. What if, what if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said, to them you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. We're going to stop right there, and we're going to answer this question, why is God patient with those who rebel against Him? These verses continue to emphasize that God's word to Abraham and His two children, those who respond to God in like faith as Abraham did, that those promises or His word has not failed. His word has not failed. We look at that again in, in verse 6, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. What we see here, the true children of Israel, whether they're Jew or Gentile, are those who respond to God in the like faith that Abraham had in response to God. In verse 8, the key in the chapter 8, excuse me, in Romans chapter 8, the key words flesh and spirit occur many times. Here in these verses, actually from verse 15 to verse uh, 29, the key word is mercy, which occurs six times. It is repeated multiple times. Similar words in this passage are compassion, patience, and love. You know, God is sovereign, free to do whatever He desires. He is sovereign. He is the Creator. He is the Lord of all the universe. God alone decides those to whom He will show mercy. It's God's choice. But the good news is that God delights to show mercy to all. 
It is His will that all should come to repentance. That all should come to repentance. Will all repent and believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? No. But it is His desire that they all come to repentance and be restored to Him in right relationship. Mercy, not wrath, is God's first choice. Why is God so patient with sinners? Paul speaks of the objects of God's wrath, prepared for destruction in verse 22, the first verse that we read tonight. He contrasts these with the objects of His mercy, whom He prepared in advance for glory. So we have those who are objects of God's wrath, and then we have those who are objects of His mercy. Verse 22, and then verse 23. Some translations have the word prepared, and as we look at this here uh, in, verse, in the latter part of verse uh, 22, uh, it says, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And we see that there. And then we also see in verse 23, prepared beforehand for glory, the very last phrase of verse 23. We might think that the word prepared in both of these means the exact same thing. Well, in the original language, in the Greek language, the word that is translated prepare means fit together or restore. Fit together or restore. The Greek word itself is uh, katharizo. And it does not, and please hear me out, it does not mean to predestine. That God chose to use them and then to throw them away or condemn them to hell. And you need to understand that. They were not predestined ultimately to end up in hell. We talked about that a lot last week, about the idea of election to salvation. Election to service and election to salvation. Now God, because He knows all things, He has foreknowledge. He knows uh, the beginning. He knows the end. He knows what's going to happen in between. He knows who those who will accept Him and embrace His message of salvation containing His Word and those who will reject it. He knows those who will embrace it and later on reject it. He knows those that seem to be impossible. They'll never believe in God, never believe in Jesus. And He knows those types of individuals who at some point in their life they embrace Christ, and their lives are transformed and changed. What happens here is that it doesn't mean predestined, but rather it shows that rebels like Pharaoh are fitted in shape to receive God's wrath. Let me just state this, little by little, one sin at a time, they forge the chains that will bind them. Little by little, one sin at a time, they, for, they forge the chains that will bind them. Their heart becomes harder and harder and harder before God. There are people today that if you tried to talk to them about Christ, they would be totally and completely uh, opposed to even hearing anything. Matter of fact, they could even be violent in their attitude, uh, in their attitudes towards you. And unfortunately, those types of things happen. There are people like that. I, I think I might have already shared this with, with some uh, at another time, but I went to the deathbed of a gentleman or a man that had had a stroke. It was a serious stroke. Uh, he was completely debilitated. He was laying on his back. He wasn't able to speak, but he was consciously aware of what was going on around him. And I remember going to that gentleman, and he must have been in his late 60s at the time, maybe early 70s, and I asked him, I said, Do you, would you like to embrace Jesus Christ as your life, Lord and Savior? Would you like to accept him? And he became agitated in that state. And I could see through his grunting and his facial features that he wanted nothing to do with Christ. Nothing at all. A man like that had at some time in his life said, I choose not to believe. I choose not to believe another man. Uh, a week before he passed, I went to his home and, and I shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him and then asked him, would he like to embrace Christ as his Lord and Savior? And he said, I'm not ready. One week, 
one week later, I was there in his hospital room with his mother as he took his last breath. And I, I don't know if he ever embraced Christ. I gave him the opportunity, told him how he could do it. I could only just leave him in the hands of a merciful God and a just God. And there are people that, for whatever reason, fight, fight in a way, such a way, against the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ. You see, each action, act of rebellion makes them into the type of people that a just God must punish. That a just God must punish. Folks, there's a lot of people in the world today that they have done bad things. And if a judge or a prosecutor does not prosecute them, judge them or prosecute them, what happens then, chaos and mayhem rule and reign. God, the just judge of the universe, whose first choice is mercy, gives people multiple opportunities. Pharaoh had multiple opportunities to listen and to surrender, but he chose in his own heart not to. He chose to disobey. If God doesn't punish acts of rebellion, what happens is that, first of all, people, if God is God, then why doesn't he do this, that, or the other? The Bible tells us in Psalms that God is slow to anger because He's a God who's full of mercy and compassion. Mercy and compassion. God loves you so much that He'll let you go on in your sin. He'll send people to you. He'll knock on the door of your heart. He'll knock on the door of your spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you're a believer in Christ, He will endeavor to bring conviction. But the more you push it off, the less and less that voice of the Holy Spirit, or you, you become spiritually deaf more and more as you push it off and push Him away. And, and God's, God's love and God's grace is there. He reaches out. That's why some people who have walked away from the Lord, they come back, they repent, and they get right back into... Uh, a relationship with the Lord and with the body of Christ, and they continue growing and, and going in the Lord. But there are those that just walk away, and there's a point in time when they say simply, I don't believe anymore. And when you come to a point like that and say, I don't believe anymore, there, there are things going on in, in one's life that are in contradiction to God's Word. They've allowed thoughts or actions or behaviors or motivations, whatever it might be, to cause that still small voice of the Holy Spirit to, to silence that voice in their lives to the point they say, I don't believe any longer. God help us. The principle that we need to hold on to is God delights to show mercy, not wrath. We humans are often quick to be angry and slow to show mercy. But God's patience amazes us. Huh. James and John, the two brothers who were disciples of Jesus, wanted to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans who rejected Jesus. God, shall we call down fire upon these rebels, these unbelievers? But our Lord explained that such an attitude of revenge was far from God. You see, when God judges, it's not out of revenge. It's because... There has been a total and complete refusal to acknowledge one's sinfulness or a corporate sinfulness if it's a group of people, a refusal to accept God's hand of mercy extended. And they turn away from it, and then God judges them because He is not just a loving, gracious, merciful God, He's also a holy, righteous, and just God. You see, we like to look at the side of His love, His grace, His mercy, His joy, His peace, and all that. And that is all a part of who God is. But at the same time, God is a just God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. And so He has to act when people choose not to listen. And they choose. It's their choice. You see, unbelieving Jews killed the prophets that God sent them. 
The prophets, God would send them messengers. Return, repent. God will receive you back to himself like a mother hen embraces her chicks. He is willing to receive you. He's willing to forgive you. Return, repent. And many of these unbelieving Jews had the prophets killed or beaten or imprisoned. They hated Jesus and rejected his miracles and ministry. They had their own idea, and we'll learn more about that as we uh, look at chapter 10. They had their own idea of what, what, the, what, what uh, the Messiah was to look like. And they thought the Messiah was going to come and that they would all have posh positions in his government. They would be the ones granted authority. They thought their own righteous acts done out of their own self-will and determination would make doors, the, the doors of heaven open up before them. They were looking at themselves and their own righteousness as a source of getting into heaven. And so when Jesus came along and he began to preach repentance, repent and believe the gospel, they weren't prepared to receive that. They were looking for a conquering Christ coming in on a white stallion that was going to push the Romans out of, uh, out of uh, Palestine and, and, and the, the former lands of Israel. And he would rule and reign and that no one could, could confront him or go against them. And like I said before, they would take positions of power and authority and of course, under the Messiah. They rejected Jesus. His miracles, his ministries, and finally, they put him to death. And if you look at Isaiah 53, it's a prophecy of Christ's death. What was Christ's response to this hatred that was shown to him, not by every Jew, but by those, in, particularly those in uh, spiritual leadership over the Jewish people? It says he wept over Jerusalem because they would not receive God's love and mercy. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37 and Luke chapter 19 verse 41. You see, God was showing them his love through his son Jesus Christ, healing those who were infirmed, those who were handicapped, the eyes that were blind were open, the leopard was, was, whose skin was like snow became pink as, as the flesh of a child again healed completely and restored. The dead were raised to life. Wow! And they had the gall to accuse him of doing all this by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And instead of embracing him as their Messiah, they rejected him. Now the Bible does prophesy that in Isaiah chapter 53 that this would happen, and it did. You see, here in this passage, we look at verse 25. We, we look at Hosea there. I will, call on the, I, I will call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. The prophet Hosea preached not only through his words that he spoke with his mouth, but also through his life. You see, God called Hosea to marry a harlot named Gomer. She represented Israel, who was unfaithful to God. You see, Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was, was rife with idolatry and rebellion against God. It's interesting that Hosea and Gomer had three children, Jezreel, Loru Hama, not loved is what it means, and Lo Ami, meaning not my people. You see that in Hosea chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. And then we find in the story, as Hosea is writing this book that is in the Old Testament, that Gomer, his wife, was unfaithful to him, and as a result, she was sold into slavery, not by Hosea, but she was taken by those with whom she was prostituting herself to, and they took her and sold her into slavery. Later, God told the prophet to buy her back and show his love to her again. <laughs> wow. You see, an earthly husband, according to some, some, some uh, interpreters of the Bible, may divorce his wife at the first sign of unfaithfulness, and particularly in the Old Testament, that's how they viewed it. 
Uh, Moses talks about that. Jesus talks about what Moses has said. This is not a preaching on the idea of uh, divorce. But what he is, God is saying here is that he, through the life of Hosea, there's a living model of God's love for the people of Israel being lived out in Hosea and Gomer's life. She was unfaithful. And God says to Hosea, go and take her back, buy her back, and receive her into your home. You see, the northern kingdom of Israel did not have one godly king in all of their history. When the time that Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, from that moment forward, they were steeped in idolatry. They served God with their lips, but not with their heart. They made uh, pretense of homage to Jerusalem, but they had two golden calves that they worshipped. Jeroboam, the king that split the kingdom from Rehoboam, who was the, the heir and successor of Solomon, and he took the northern tribes with him and said, you go and do your own thing and we're going to do ours. It's interesting that all those years later, many, many years later, God continued to love them for all those years. For all those years. This kind of love and mercy is almost unbelievable. I can guarantee you it would be hard for us to forgive someone who continually and repeatedly does those things which are evil towards us and rejects us and says evil about us and talks to us in an in a evil manner. As Paul says, God's love and mercy are beyond our understanding. We can't understand His love and mercy. So some people get upset. Well, why did God do this? Why did God do that? It's not that God did this or that God did that. It's that God, for a long time, was reaching out and saying, come back to me. Come back to me. And ultimately, and finally, God in His justice had to allow judgment to pass upon His people. And it said in De Deuteronomy, if you follow Me, you will be blessed. If you don't, you will be cursed and you will be taken from the land. But God's patience is long-suffering. God's love surpasses knowledge. Our ability to comprehend it goes so far. That's the reason why God is able to save someone that you would say in your own heart are not capable of being saved. And maybe we'd even go as far as saying they are not worthy of being saved because of all the evil that they have done. And God is able to reach out to those individuals in their darkest moment, in that moment where everything around them is coming down and, and collapsing around them, and he's able to reach into their pit of darkness and pull them out. Corey Tim Boone's sister, while she was in the German concentration camp, said these words to encourage her sister because uh, Corey was having a difficult time because of all the suffering they were going through. And Eliz was her name Elizabeth, Cynthia? Beth. Yeah, Beth, Elizabeth or Beth. And she said, Corey, there's no pit so deep that God's love isn't deeper still. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Folks, that's the God that we serve. He reaches out in love and kindness. He desires us to walk in relationship with Him. You see, in Romans 9, verse 25, Paul quotes from Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. This passage in Hosea prophesied that God would once again love Israel and they would again be His people. God would restore them to Himself. Paul uses this passage to illustrate that God's patience is to show mercy on Jews and Gentiles. On Jews and Gentiles. Unfortunately, most people never change, no matter how patient God is. You see, Jesus himself said, narrow is the gate that leads to life, 
Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go on that road because it's an easy road. I don't want to believe. I just do my own thing. It's fine. It's great. If God's there, well, I'm a good old Joe. He'll let me in. No. God has paid the ultimate price in giving His Son to die on the cross for our sins that we might be forgiven. Because, but because God is patient and merciful, some change from the group Lo Ruhama, not loved, to Ruhama, loved. And they move from Lo Ami, not my people, to Ami, my people. And sons of the living God. As you see that verse 24 and 20, or 25 and 26 of chapter 9. You see, this mother. My father had a wayward son. He lived with them, but he was constantly breaking their heart into drugs, into partying, into immorality, all that. That was his, he, he didn't even want to talk with his parents. He was, he was basically, his parents' home was a stopover at night so he could sleep off his latest outing. And one night, the father got up and his wife wasn't in bed and he went down the hall looking in the room and opened the door to his son's bedroom and there was his wife sitting on the side of the bed stroking her son's hair. And the dad said, why? He has hurt us so much. Why? And she said simply, because this is the only time that I can love on him. I can love him. You can imagine the brokenness of that heart, of that mama. Imagine the brokenness of God and his heart. When people refuse to listen, and they go their own way, and they throw a fist in his face and say, I don't believe you're there, or I don't care if you're there. I'm doing my own thing. You see, God steps into people's darkness to show them his love. It could be in the a fortified prison. It could be in some tavern or bar somewhere. It could be in any type of hellhole that exists. And God's love steps into that darkness and he's willing to embrace them if they're willing to listen to him and come to him. But God loves people even when they do not want him to love them. He loves them still. God causes, God's love causes him to wait for people to turn their lives over to him. He is a patient, loving God. And because of that, he will save at least a remnant of people. Because there will be those that will embrace his love, that will embrace what he has done for them through his son, Jesus Christ. No, God's word to Abraham has not failed. God's word to Abraham has not failed. Because of his mercy, there is a remnant that walks with God by faith. There is a remnant that walks with God by faith and receives Jesus as Savior and Lord. The Jews in their stubborn unbelief, only a remnant during the time of the early church came to believe Jesus as their Messiah and receive Christ as their Messiah. Even today, in, in, in Israel, there are those who are even Orthodox Jews that would respond violently towards those who are true followers of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about those who profess Christ and then persecute the Jews. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those who are true followers of Christ. They would turn away from them and they would reject them and even do violence to them because they have rejected Christ. 
They have rejected God's offer of mercy and love and salvation. A remnant, though, will be saved. As it was in the early church and throughout history, the great part of the revival when, when they began to call believers in Jesus Christians in Antioch for the first time, they called that title Christian, was added to them or placed upon them. It was because Christian meant to be like Christ, to be a follower of Christ, someone who acted and believed in Christ, acted like Christ and believed in Him. They were called Christians. But many of those people that were called Christians in Antioch were those who were Gentiles, who chose to place their faith. See, they were in a polytheistic, deistic type of environment where there were gods all over the place. Gods of war, gods of immorality, gods of this, gods of that, gods of fertility. I mean, just on and on and on it went. They had a multiplicity of gods. Can you imagine the confusion that they lived in trying to please this God and that God? And, and on and on and on it went. And then when they heard the gospel for the first time, these Gentiles who did not have the same upbringing of believing in one God, monotheistic, a belief in one God. Those individuals, as they were hearing the gospel preached by the apostles and by believers as they were testifying throughout all of the Roman Empire and beyond, they embraced the truth of Jesus Christ and, his, and the love and patience and mercy of God, and they were transformed. The Bible, the Bible tells us that, 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 that it was even being spoken that these Christians have turned the world upside down. Within just a matter of, 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 of a quarter of a, a century after Christ's resurrection, it's estimated that there were between, there was around, excuse me, 10% of the Roman Empire had converted to Christ, had given their lives, had believed the truth of Jesus. God's mercy reaching out to those idolaters, those people who served these gods that were non existent. And in this situation, received the hope of eternal life. You see, God is patient with us. And I'm so thankful. I know there, you know, I think back to the time when I accepted Jesus Christ. Now, I wasn't, I was just a kid. I knew I had done bad things that I've shared with you before. Those of you who have been here since we've arrived here, I've shared some of my testimony of salvation, how I accepted Christ. and I was just a child, but I knew I was a sinner. I knew it. I knew it. I knew I had done bad things. I knew I had purposely disobeyed my mom. I knew I had purposely hurt my sister. And there was a streak in me that wasn't good. I can only imagine what I'd be today if I hadn't come to Christ and given him my life. And he reached out to me in his mercy. Have I lived perfectly since that time? No. I've had my battles. I've had my struggles. I've had my, my failings. And every time my knee has hit the ground, I've lifted my hand up to Jesus. And without hesitation, he reaches it down. And he says, let me pick you up. Let me pick you up. And he's picked me up, and he's embraced me. And he's given me the strength to go on and to persevere, to fight the good fight of faith, and not to allow the circumstances and situations around me or my own flesh to, to drag me away from him. Folks, that's the love of our God. His patience and his mercy. If you've experienced that, don't throw it away. Don't throw it away. With the time that's remaining, I'm looking at it, we have about 11 minutes here or so before our time is done. We're going to move to the next section in chapter 9, 10, and 11. And this section will be dealing with Israel's present rejection, unbelief towards the gospel. And that's chapter 9, verse 30, through chapter 10, verse 21. 
Now, these are powerful verses, and we'll get into more detail in a few moments here, but I just want to do a quick review. For some of you, you've just joined us recently and are following us now for the last several weeks, but you haven't been here for this whole uh, study on the book of Romans. Let me just give you this quick synopsis. The first, the, 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 Paul's letter to the Romans contains five sections, five big parts, or we could say five units. The first unit describes the problem, our need for righteousness. Romans chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 3, verse 20. This, these verses or these chapters emphasize that all have sinned. Both Jews and Gentiles deserve God's judgment. All sinners are under God's wrath. We all fall short of what God requires. We all need God to provide righteousness for us. And that's what those verses talk about. It lays out the case that we need God's solution for our sin problem. And the solution, because sin separates us from God, we can't be in God's presence with sin in our lives. So what God has laid out before us is His plan of salvation and sending His Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, to become the final sacrifice for sins. Blood had to be shed that our sins would be forgiven. And here, in, verse, in these first three chapters, it talks about the necessity and the reasons why we are guilty before God. It lays out the argument. Then the second unit emphasizes the solution. We receive righteousness by faith in Christ. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 5, verse 21, Abraham was among the first to receive righteousness through believing, through trusting God. He is like a spiritual father or forefather of all who seek a relationship with God through faith and trust. Through faith and trust. So the second part, we have the, we have the problem, the sin problem. Then we have God sending His Son Jesus Christ and as we place our faith and trust in Him, our lives are changed. And then the third part, ver- chapters 6-8, through eight, reveals the key to living a life of victory and holiness. These chapters contrast the desires of the flesh and the desires of the Spirit. Under under the law, people often failed to please God because they couldn't keep all the law. For although the law pointed the right way, the flesh pulled the wrong way. That flesh being us and our own fleshly desires. But under the new covenant, under what Christ has done for us, God frees us from the bondage of sin. And He empowers righteous living by His Spirit. As we submit to His Spirit within us and resist the evil desires of the flesh, we walk in freedom and please God. His powerful Spirit enables us to live a life of love which summarizes and fulfills the law. You find that in Romans chapter 8, verse 4. The fourth unit examines Israel and God's plan of salvation. That's where we're at currently. There's three parts. Israel's past election, Israel's present rejection, and Israel's future restoration. And we'll be continuing to develop that. And the last unit is chapters 12 through 16, gives practical application for righteous living. For righteous living. Again, that's just a quick summary and synopsis of the book of Romans. And we are in the fourth unit right now. And we have just completed Israel's past election. Romans 9, 1 through 29. And right now, we're going to begin, let's go ahead and read the scriptures here. I'm not sure how far we'll actually get uh, this evening into this, but we can can begin, and then when it's 7.30, we'll we'll, we'll, uh, bring it to a close. But let's look at verse 30 in chapter 9, and we're going to read chapter 10. I know it's a lot of reading, but... Let's go ahead and look at what God's Word says. What shall we say then? Verse 30, chapter 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not obtained to the law of righteousness. Why? That's very important that we understand the answer. Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And we'll talk about that as we develop these verses. As it is written, Behold, I lay, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whoever believes on him will 
not be put to shame. And then we continue in chapter 10. Brethren, my heart, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That was his heart. That was his passion. That was his, 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 his cry to God. God, that the, the Jews, his, his people, would come to saving faith. Verse 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ now has become our source of righteousness. It's not endeavoring somehow to obey the laws in the Old Testament, but allowing Christ to help us to walk in a way pleasing and honoring to God. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. In verse 6, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. And right now, as I'm reading this, we are moving into a passage that is so powerful. It shows us how one can be restored into a right relationship with the Lord. It says that if you confess, this is the word, this is what we're speaking, he's saying, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he asks a series of questions, and we covered this in a message recently. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. I'm glad it doesn't stop there because chapter, chapter 11 talks about how God, will, how God is reaching out to his people. Yes, there was that initial pushback. They did not want to embrace Jesus as their Messiah. Cursed is he who dies. And the New, New International Version says on a pole. And the King James Version on a tree. So anyone who dies or is hung on a tree or a pole is cursed according to Deuteronomy. Just read that this morning because that's where I'm reading in my devotions. Cursed. Jesus became a curse for us so that we could be restored into a right relationship with Father God. His mercy. This passage is so rich and we don't have the time tonight to unpack it. 
So we're going to have to dive into it next week and unpack chapter 10. And, and uh, it's my prayer that the Lord will enable us to really uh, glean and gain everything out of chapter 10. Uh, thank you so much for your patience as we have been moving forward in this study. It has not been a study that has done a what we call a flyover. Uh, we're, we're sort of like a, a plane that is skirting the ground, just like that agricultural plane that flies over that spray that sprays the fields i just saw him the other day and i thought man that guy must only be about 75 feet above ground uh above the ground because the plane looked bigger than life as it was flying over the homes uh just behind the church here i thought well that's what we're trying to do here we're trying to get down to where we can really see it now there might be other professors who are able to teach it in greater depth and greater understanding and i understand that but I'm doing the best that I can with what I have, and I'm believing God to continue to work in us over this time. Uh, I just want to share with you real quick here. Uh, Saturday morning at the Humboldt property at 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the morning, we're going to be doing uh, a deep cleaning. Uh, and those of you who are able to come will have the materials, the gloves, and all that stuff will be made available to you as we... Uh, do the deep cleaning to get everything prepared for the actual renovation work, which will begin sometime in September. And so if you're able to join us, it'd be great to have you. More hands, less work, and we'll be able to get it done. Um, uh, I want to invite you to be a part of that if you're able to. And secondly, I'd like to ask you to uh, be patient with us as we're trying to figure out how to navigate the time with the smoke and, and the heat and the things of that nature. And uh, we have uh, decided that this Sunday we're going to be live once again on Sunday morning for Sunday morning service. So please join us at Chalchilla First Assembly of God. That's our Facebook page. And you'll be able to follow the service. Uh, and we're starting, we're continuing to keep the, the rhythm at 8.30 in the morning. I know it's early for some of you. Some of you may want to choose to watch it at the regular time. It should be uploaded by that time. And you'll be able to follow us on Facebook at 10.30 if that's what you so choose to do. But we're going to do that, that this Sunday, and as we've been doing Sunday evening and Wednesday night, we're going to continue live streaming until we're able to get back into our building, and the, the government gives us the release there to do so. Uh, the first Sunday of September, we're moving forward with to be announced, how we are going to do the service. Um, so I'd like you to be patient with us, believe with us, and trust God with us that he would guide us and direct us. Uh, we are looking into the possibility of using our church playground. They have a nice grassy area and also the barbecue area with the picnic tables is concrete. And we're looking at uh, doing something in that area and using pop-ups uh, or canopies that pop up as shelter, shelter from the sun and having fans and stuff out there to blow some air to make it cooler. And, uh, and that also continuing to be at 8.30 in the morning when it is much cooler. Um, we do need some pop-ups. We have uh, the canopies. We have, we have seven right now. We need to have at least three more in order to be able to uh, uh, accommodate the idea that I'm having with the square footage that we have there. And we're asking everybody to bring, we'll be asking everybody to bring their own lawn chairs, but we will let you know when that's going to happen. If it's still air quality poor on the 6th of September, we're going to wait until things get better. And so it's a week-by-week -week thing right now. So please be patient with us as we're working through this and trying to get things taken care of. Please know that Sister Cindy and I, we love you folks. Uh, we're going to be calling some of you and asking you if we can come over and visit you. We're trying to go through the church uh, roster and, and set up times when we can come over. And we come with our mask. If, if that makes you feel more comfortable, we'll have all that. Uh, we just want to, to connect with you and touch bases with you. Uh, please continue to keep Ruth and Mikhail Mueller in prayer as they're preparing to come. They showed me a picture today of their suitcases already packed and ready to go. They're anxious to be here with us, and so let's pray for them that they all have no glitches or hang-ups. They get on that plane, and they're here uh, with us on the 4th of September. And we're so look, looking forward to having them with us to work alongside of us to see what God can do through, through their ministry. Let's close with a word of prayer. And then I'll let you folks go. Father, thank you so much for your word tonight. Oh, your mercy, your love, your patience goes so far beyond our comprehension. And Lord, even when we're in rebellion against you, either as believers or maybe before we accepted you, Lord, the way that we were, 
your love was patient with us and you reached out to us and you drew us to yourself. And Father God, I just pray that you would continue to help us to not forget that you're a God full of compassion, full of mercy, full of patience, and that you desire people everywhere to come to salvation. And God, I just pray that you'd help us to be faithful witnesses for you, that our lives would be filled with the same type of love, the same type of compassion, and the same type of patience. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Be glorified and be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be seeing you soon.